Um, so thank you so much to everyone who's come along today and to Professor Julia Steinberger, who's with us to present on uh, ecological economics. And um, we're incredibly excited to welcome her today to this series of events uh, where we've been introducing different schools of thought um, in, in economics outside of the mainstream. Uh, this is going to be the last um, of these introductory series because uh, after this we're taking a little break and then we're planning our big summer festival, um, which I'm not sure if you guys went to last year, it was really great. So I definitely recommend uh, keeping your eyes peeled for it, more information on that. Um, and after this session as well, uh, you can stick around because we've got two more sessions, which I'll describe a bit later. Um, but yeah, uh, without further ado, uh, over to you, uh, Julia. Thanks, guys. I think you're on mute. Uh... Your your screen share was working yeah, fine. Was yeah, I can hear yeah, you now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a second. It, I think something got scrambled when I tried sharing. Uh, sorry about that. Oh, no worries, no worries. So, no worries, no worries. Um, okay, so uh, thanks so much for being here. And uh, I hope that what I have to say will be interesting. So I'll get right into it. I just wanted to say this is a very rare picture. There, it's very rare to get the picture of the, the Wall Street bull and the bold girl. Um, so uh, if you want one, that's a good one. That's, um, uh, how do you say, Creative Commons. Um, it's got a whole story behind it. Anyway. Uh, so I'm just going to tell you a bit about context. So um, I have to tell you about climate because um, part of uh, that's part of my topic, and I really try to use every opportunity I have to give more information about it because I don't think we have enough. Um, I want to tell you about ecological economics, where it came from, some of its main people, and then I want to also want to tell you about my own research. <laughs> so the Living Well Within Limits project. So um, we'll get right to it. So the uh, climate one, context. One Sorry to interrupt yeah. you, one quick thing. Could you go to the slideshow bit and make it full screen? I... Is that okay? I'm sharing another application window. That is so weird. Okay, let us go back. Sorry about that. We are going Sorry to try this that. until it works. Yeah, yeah. Try it now. Is that working now? No, it keeps saying I'm just um, sharing another application window. Is this it? So if, can you see yeah, some? yeah. So we can see your screen. So if you go on your screen to the slideshow bit, uh, if yeah, you go Yeah, but up, then I go to slide share. Wait, what uh, is it showing you? It's, it's showing us the slides, but they're, they're not like full screen like they normally are. It's just showing us like the normal PowerPoint view. So if you could maybe click on slideshow at the top. Sure at the top. Yeah. Um, and then from beginning or from current beginning. slide. Can you see it now? Uh, it... Oh, no, we can't. Never mind. It's fine like that. We can see it well enough. Um, um, well, this is annoying. But what I can do is I can at least make it bigger. Yeah, that's a lot so better. I'm yeah, that yeah. Basically, when I go to, I think what's happening is when I go to full screen, it basically thinks that that's a different screen. Yeah, yeah. Which is a little bit frustrating. I'm sorry about that. Oh, no, it's fine. Don't worry. This is great. Uh, so you start. might see like some of my okay, so we'll just we'll just uh, I'm really sorry. So hopefully it's big enough to see now. Is it okay? But that's perfect. That's perfect. Okay. So, um, so just going to talk a bit about the climate context. So this is a picture of the town of Vesuvius in France, which was sort of a, uh, reasonably well devastated uh, just a few months ago in the winter. Um, so climate stuff is happening all over the world. So I just want to go over some really basic basics. Um, so what are the physical causes, just so we're all on the same page. So the physical causes um, of climate change are greenhouse gases, of which uh, carbon dioxide is sort of the majority, 80%. The others are sort of methane and NOx and whatever else is 20%. But there's also another big cause of climate change, which is deforestation and changes in land use. And that should not be forgotten about. And 100% of it is human activity, which now, with now sort of has additional natural, except they're not natural in the sense of occurring naturally, they're natural in the sense of their natural physical phenomenon, feedback loops that are driven by the human activity of climate, uh, climate change itself. 
So what economic activities are the cause of uh, emissions and land use change? So we have economic activities and economics is driving this, which is why rethinking economics is really important because we need a real change in what's happening. So the economic activities that we're doing that burn fossil fuels to emit CO2, uh, so we're burning petrol, diesel, heating fuel, gas, coal, um, and those are for electricity, transport, heating, industry. And uh, the agriculture and food supply, which drives the land use, is used for livestock, especially red meat, beef, sheep, pork. Uh, palm oil is really important for biodiesel in Europe, but uh, also finds itself in pharmaceutical products um, like beauty products and um, uh, food. So palm, palm oil is really uh, a large uh, driver of deforestation around the world. Uh, and that goes into nutrition as well as transport. And um, Cement, which is a big emitter of CO2, uh, goes into buildings and infrastructure. So basically, when you look at all the economic activities that are contributing to driving climate change, you basically cover pretty much everything. So it's really important to try to understand how we connect our production, consumption, transformation processes to think about how to do things differently. Um, so I would say that we have a scientific basis for the climate emergency, which could be uh, found in the special report on 1.5 degrees of the IPCC. Um, so the IPCC, uh, which I'm part of, I'm not speaking in the name of the IPCC, but I am about of the IPCC, but I am part of it. Um, that it's re response to governments, and so the problem here was that governments signed up to the Paris Agreement, and the Paris Agreement does this funny thing: it aims to keep warming below two degrees with 1.5 degrees as sort of a maximum goal. So first question: What do these temperatures mean? Um, they are global average warming, so average of above sea and above earth, compared to pre-industrial era. So the pre-industrial era you might define as, in, you know, 1700, 1750, before we got started burning a lot of coal in England. Um, that's your zero, that's your baseline. And then the question is, what's the warming above that? And it might seem, these might seem like small numbers at the global level, they are not, they are devastating. So the governments were wondering, is warming by two degrees already too dangerous? And they didn't know. So they asked, uh, they asked the IPCC to prepare this uh, report from them, which is really trying to compare, okay, what's going on in this Paris Agreement? What's the difference between 1.5 and two degrees? And um, I'm just gonna give you one example of the kind of changes we see at different levels of warming, um, which basically shows you um, uh, the links between climate change and biodiversity. So, uh, but there are lots of other impacts on human health, on disease spread, on sea level rise, on ecosystems all over the world. But this is a, this is a pretty big one. Um, so this study uh, by Warren et al. in Science, which came out uh, a few years ago, basically looked at the geographical coverage, the, ge the geographical zone occupied by species. And the point is, if you limit the extent, the range of a species by 50% 50, 50 or more, that species is considered to be at risk of extinction. And what they found is that if we keep temperatures low, you know, warming low below 1.5 degrees or around 1.5 degrees, um, that quite a few species are at risk of extinction, but uh, it stays below 10% for the different categories they looked at, which are listed here. By the time you get to two degrees, it's, 8% um, of vertebrates, 16% uh, of plants, and 18% of insects. So that's like almost one out of five insects at risk of extinction, which is already very large, very dangerous. We do not exist without them, right? Um, by the time we get to three degrees or more, we're talking about really large numbers. Uh, so really large fractions of insect, uh, so almost half of insect and plant species being at risk of extinction by 200, uh, 2,100 and a quarter of vertebrates. So we're talking about a really devastating shift and you can tell it's very nonlinear. You know, it's not like, uh, you know, 1.52 degrees is twice as bad as one degree or anything like that. It's like, this is very nonlinear and it's like that with all the different impacts. Um, so things get a lot worse. So every single fraction of a degree of warming is something that's definitely worth fighting for. Um, so this normally has some, uh, some animations. You're not gonna see all my animations, this is sad, uh, but that's okay. Uh, so the, the point of this slide is just to, 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 set, to, to explain that we're on this very, um, uh, we're on this, uh, still on this trajectory of acceleration. 
of emissions. So um, emissions are going up and up and up and accumulating in the atmosphere faster and faster and faster. So we're not at all on a trajectory of decline or the trajectory that we should be on. And the commitments of countries within the Paris Agreement would lead us to um, roughly three degrees, maybe a bit higher. If you're pessimistic about them implementing new measures and delivering the measures that they've agreed to, maybe a bit below three degrees. If you think that their commitments, um, uh, that they will, that they will uh, live through their commitments, maybe the climate summit yesterday is enough to shift that even a bit lower, depending on what actually gets implemented. But right now, what's on the books in terms of country commitments, um, in terms of their policies, would take us above three degrees. So we are really in trouble. Uh, and we've now left the Holocene, so we have a really uh, uncertain future ahead of us. So the Holocene is sort of the, the time in the last um, uh, 10,000 years, 12,000 years since the last ice age, when human beings developed everything, agriculture, cities, anything you would call civilization, was thanks to this narrow band of relatively warm temperatures above the ice age, which is the Holocene uh, temperature range that you can see here in pink. And we've definitely now left that. We're now at 1.2 degrees already above um, the pre-industrial baseline. Um, so we are definitely like zooming out of it and going into a really uncertain and dangerous future. So the question here is who could possibly have known? Who knew where we were heading? Who knew what future we were being pushed into? And this is a plot that comes from an internal memo from Exxon, which is one of the large um, fossil fuel companies. They wrote this in 1982, but they did not publish it. It was an internal publication. It was not for external consumption. But what you can see is that they absolutely knew. So here, this is the plot of where they expected the atmospheric concentration of CO2 to be. So they were a bit above where we are now. In terms of temperature, they're quite a bit below, but um, they, they, you know, they knew that they were going to be, that we were going to be increasing temperature quite a bit. Um, and uh, instead of stopping their business model, instead of you know, taking stock of what the science was, was their own internal scientists were telling them, what they decided to do was to keep this knowledge secret, to spend millions and millions of dollars year upon year upon year, um, lobbying governments into climate denial, attacking scientists, trying to get scientists kicked out of their jobs, sending them death threats. Um, so they really um, engineered the future that we are in out now. We are in this acceleration into a very dangerous time because of the activities of an economic actor. And that's something to think about. So what is ecological economics in all this? And what does it tell us? So let's just start with what ecological economics is not, um, because that's really important to clarify from the get go. So ec uh, ecological economics is not environmental economics. And I have to apologize, everything, you can see all the little um, red underlines is because I wrote this in a French version of PowerPoint. So it was trying to spell check all the English words. I'm sorry about that. So it is not environmental economics. The two are completely separate domains. Uh, environmental economics is very much part of neoclassical economics. Um, it has a cost benefit perspective and it basically is looking for an optimal way to uh, exploit the environment, and it has a very weak sustainability view where you can substitute the environment for man-made capital or man-made wealth. Um, so that is not the case for uh, ecological economics. So the origins of ecological economics, um, most people would probably go back to George S. Rogan. There might be some people before him, but he certainly got it started. Uh, in 1971, he wrote uh, Economic Law and the Entropy Process, which is a very dense book. I don't necessarily recommend it. I mean, it's very interesting, but it is not easy reading. But his basic point is that he's criticizing the fundamental goal of neoclassical economics, which is that goal was to be a predictive science, a bit like physics, where you predict based on knowing the starting point of a system, you're predicting where it's going to be. And it has to be a system close to equilibrium for that to happen. And instead, what his point was, listen, the, the economy is a statistical, complex, disordered system. It doesn't have to be anywhere near equilibrium. And entropy and physical reality plays a, a core role. And this idea of entropy is really important for the link with the environment, because the, the basic idea is that you extract low entropy, high quality inputs from the environment. 
uh, you transform them through your economy and the stuff that comes out the other way is qualitatively different. So emissions and waste that come out the other side are high entropy and low quality. And this is why a purely circular economy will never be possible, right? You can improve things, but you are always, your economy will always take in low entropy, high quality goods and emit high, high entropy, low quality outputs. And um, this is something that really needs to be understood. The next person who might be important to understand is Herman Daly. Um, he wrote this book, Beyond Growth, uh, which is still really interesting to read. And he sort of has three scales of priorities. Um, one, so basically he says, we need to rethink the economy completely. So again, this is a fundamental challenge to neoclassical economics because the, the environment is not something to just be dealt with by cost benefit. The environment is a fundamental challenge. And that's why his first priority is the scale. The scale of economic activities has to be uh, determined by environmental limits and planetary boundaries, which we are overstepping. See previous discussion. Um, and the scale priority of daily is translated into steady state economy, um, originally proposed by John Stuart Mill. I'm not going to talk about it much more now, but I just want to say that the steady state economy is still an active, ongoing interest in research and advocacy. And Dan O'Neill at the University of Leeds, uh, my former colleague, or still my colleague, um, is a big proponent. Um, going back to Herman Daly's list of priorities, the next one, Dan, is distribution. We need a social aspect to the economy. Distribution should be fair and enable good living standards for all. And then the third one is allocation, uh, where he basically says, listen, now we can do market. Once we do those two, we can do market allocation. However, uh, Elke Piergmeier, who's my PhD student and my dear uh, collaborator, uh, pointed out that this is problematic for various reasons. So if you're interested, please go read her paper. Um, and I think it's really interesting because it brings in the politi Marxian political economy into ecological economics, which I think is very important and something that's a big priority. Um, I'd like to bring in Danella Meadows. She's not necessarily uh, ecological economics in the sort of canon part of the world, but um, it's really, her work is really important. She was the first author of the Club of Rome um, Limits to Growth Report. And she really had this, this vision of complexity and system dynamics as a field of work, which is really interesting. And she also brought that into um, a social science sphere as well. And I'm really, if I can, if you do one thing as a result of this talk, go read this point, uh, this leverage points, uh, places to intervene in a system, which is a very short piece she wrote in 1999. You can find it very easily on the internet. And she really has this idea of, say we wanna change a system, what are the leverage points? What's the most important thing we can do? And it turns out that the economy is part of it, but other parts of it are very, important as well. And I just think it's, um, it's a really important way to, to think about the world uh, through a systemic way. Uh, current areas in ecological economics, I'm just going to sort of zoom through them because there was lots more um, to say. Uh, so I'll just go through and uh, talk about a few of them. So there's this idea of visibility, that basically we can make the environment visible through efforts like, for instance, monetary valuation of, for the, of the environment. So this is very different than saying the environment has to be understood as cost benefit. It's like we need to make the we need to make the environment visible to the economy and all its importance. And one of the main people who's active here is Robert Costanza. So um, we who talks who does things like valuation of ecosystem services and and uh, that work is quite important. Um, there's a biophysical perspective, which is probably one of the ways that I started in ecological economics, um, where basically what you're doing is you're measuring and modeling the interconnections between these, these natural resources and technology, um, economic activity, and so on. And um, so one of the, one of the, this is sort of the, the caricature of this is that we're basically looking for decoupling. Green growth would like to look for decoupling. Um, and decoupling of environmental impact from, uh, from resource use and from environmental impacts. And so you sort of see this as restructuring the economy or technological improvement. Now, long story short, I was going to prepare this whole thing on this, but it turns out there's too much material that's really come out in the last couple of years. The evidence is overwhelming now by now that green growth is either not happening or not happening fast enough. And that rebound effects are real and that they drive economic growth. So that when we put efficiency, this technical improvement bit in, it actually drives economic growth even more. And so, uh, for instance, people like Paul Brockway, 
is one of the leaders in this domain. Um, Dominique Wiedenhofer and Helmut Haberl have written papers, Jason Hickel and Georgos Kallis as well. So I think there's a lot, there's just a lot of overwhelming evidence trying, basically telling us that this, I, this dream of decoupling is probably not in reality. Um, and uh, there's this idea of looking at what transitions mean. So when we're looking at biophysical transitions of different kinds of economic systems, what does that actually tell us? What does it mean to go from an industrial to a sustainable um, economy in terms of the material underpinnings? Then there's a lot of work on beyond growth. So there's a lot of growth criticism, maybe too much growth criticisms. So maybe we shouldn't be focused so much on growth. Maybe we should be focused more on the systematics of it. But um, there's a need. So the idea of a macroeconomics for sustainability, which is something that Tim Jackson, but also Inga Rupka have been talking about. Uh, Tim Jackson has a new book out as well. Um, there is uh, degrowth, which is uh, really a key movement demanding fundamental change in economics and society and environmental thinking. Um, one of the leaders there is Georgos Kallas, but we're also going to be hearing from Ricardo Mastini in just a bit. I'm looking forward to that. Um, they came up with policy proposals, and there's a huge explosion and growth in degrowth books. So you are living at a time where it is extremely easy to learn about this and to debate about it. There's a lot of contention. A lot of people get upset about the term. Um, we can talk about that in the discussion, hopefully. But I think it's really important to, to, have, to open that debate. Um, because right now, growth has this sort of almost religious significance in our societies that is probably not very healthy. And this is not necessarily um, an ecological economics um, contribution, but I thought it was really, I, I really gained a lot of insights from it. It's called the New Systems Readers, uh, New Systems Reader Alternatives to a Failed Economy. It has a huge amount of contributions. If you're looking for ideas, this is great. All right, so I'm now giving myself five minutes after all that to tell you a bit about my own work. So I am very much inspired by Kate Rayworth and uh, Donut Economics. So her idea of, you know, trying to achieve both social and environmental outcomes and asking the economy what, you know, seeing what economy is necessary to do that. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about that. Um, we have this project, Living Well Within Limits, has been running for uh, four and a half years now. Um, so we found a whole bunch of things. We found, we've looked at inequality. We found that there's a huge inequality um, between and within countries and also within product categories of consumption. Some, uh, the consumption of the riches tends to be energy intensive transport. Um, and one of the lessons for us there is we can't grow our way out of climate change because richer people tend to consume high intensity, high polluting goods. Um, so that's something that uh, we really see quite clearly now. Um, fossil fuel use is highly correlated, highly correlated at any point in time with life expectancy, which is sort of a good international indicator of well-being but can only account for 22% of its increase over time. So this really means that despite the sort of propaganda of the fossil fuel companies, where basically they want us to believe that they can help us with everything, that, they're, that they underpin all we do, the consumption of their products is not necessary for development. And that's also probably interesting. Um, we allow ourselves to criticize consumption, which is something that mainstream economics has a hard time doing. So um, we believe that there's such a thing as underconsumption and such a thing as overconsumption. Uh, we look at this international inequality or international inequality. Um, and uh, I'm not going to go over this, but one of the things, um, uh, so we did this work on, on distribution of consumption. Um, yeah, well, maybe I can just tell, tell you this a bit. So basically this is just mapping the international energy footprints depending where basically populations across the world are ranked not just by their country but by income classes and you really see um, international patterns that come out and you really see how people who are rich and poor across the world consume things and you can see that inequality for instance is much lower in food energy related to food energy related to housing and much higher um, in energy, you know, you, you can see these curves sort of deviating more and more from the, the from the curve of equality as you go into transport products. And maybe the orange one would include things like public transportation. The purple one is private vehicle fuel, so so car, and uh, the blue one is something more like um, leisure and air transport. 
So you can really see huge amounts of distribution, distributional inequality there. Um, we also tried to model sufficient energy for all. So we basically used the work of Narasimha Rao on decent living energy. And we looked at um, basically levels. We basically gave everybody in the world, no matter where they live, no matter how old they are, um, uh, a certain, the same rough amount of energy services. And then we build up on that based on efficient technology. So we're basically saying everybody's allowed the same material wealth, basically, or income, or whatever you want to call it, material use. But we're going to deliver it in the in the most efficient way possible. And um, as a result of that, what we what we find is that we that could be done based on um, current technologies at about less than half the level of energy that we currently use. So on this plot, you can see um, the plot that's on the left. I'm not going to talk about the, the plot on the right, but the plot on the left, you can see that global final energy goes up over time. The three scenarios that are red, orange, and yellow are International Energy Agency. So the reference scenario, business as usual, we keep growing, we keep emitting. Um, then they have a two degree scenario, which is the orange one, and the below two degrees, which is the yellow one, where you can see that there's sort of a stabilization. I mean, if you wanted to call that degrowth, you might, but it's mainly sort of a stabilization at current levels. Uh, there was a previous low energy demand scenario by Arnold Grubler, which already got quite, quite low energy use. But the decent living energy, which was the, the, the model that we came up with, you know, um, says that we can, we can do this uh, at even lower levels. So if every if we're, our goal is uni, you know universal decent living standards, we can we can do it with efficient technologies um, uh, uh, despite population growth into the future. So hopefully that's good news, even though that's not where we're going right now. And I think I will end it there. I'm really um, so that we can go into questions and hopefully there's a lot more to talk about there. And I'm sorry about the whole um, slide sharing thing, which uh, didn't work so much oh don't worry about it the slides were fine um and yeah thank you so much for that that was incredibly uh, insightful and useful um so we have one question so far everyone else uh if you could uh maybe post some more questions that'd be useful i've got some as well though um but henry has asked uh, which books would you recommend as kind of like an introduction or easier type of uh kind of reading about ecological economics um which book okay there have been some really lots of really great books recently so an in i mean the, the there's sort of some classics maybe maybe Arald and and uh, ricardo can can think of some more as well there's some, some sort of classics which are um there's one by i'm gonna forget their names there's one by josh farley and there's one by ingrid stagel um but i think that the the ones on the ones around degrowth that I recommended will will also have some of that some of those elements. So th those might be interesting as well. So uh, I'll just write Farley, um, Stagel. They're different books. Um, I think that uh, Dan O'Neill's uh, Dan O'Neill's book on steady state economics is is good as well. Um, but maybe maybe there are there are others to suggest. Um, I see there's a question on green growth. Should I answer that? Sorry, my internet's really, Sorry. really bad. Um, so I just cut out. But yeah, if, if you could just answer those questions, if that'd be right. Sure. Um, so in terms of uh, green growth, so the idea of green growth is, is sort of the main, the, the dream, uh, which honestly, if it could work, it would be great because then we wouldn't have to worry about <laughs> I mean we wouldn't have, we could live with the current economic system which is both growth driven and growth dependent so green the idea of green growth is you can keep growing gdp but at the same time so let me I'll do it in pronouns you're growing gdp like this but at the same time your emissions are going down your resource use is going down you're decoupling you're basically saying you're dematerializing gdp you're decarbonizing gdp you're basically saying listen um, we can grow without these impacts. The, the problem with that is it's not true. So, and generally when people, um, I spent quite a bit, quite a few years looking for this as well. I mean, everybody was sort of looking for it and people are still looking for it. Um, but the, the, the idea of, okay, let's look for countries that are doing this. Let's look for economies that are doing this. 
and they're just not, not there, especially not once you take into account international trade. There are some econ, there are a few, for instance, that are decarbonizing while growing GDP. Even taking into account trade, they're not doing it fast enough. Not doing, they're not going to get us to zero fast enough. And we need to get to zero emissions. Otherwise, we are really heading into a disastrous future. So this idea of green growth is a bit of um it's often used as a as a sort of like let us grow our way out of this problem, let us just develop new technology through growth and innovation that will get rid of our problem. But growth growth itself is part of the problem. So it's 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 kind of like the it's almost like if the medicine was giving you more poison. It's it's not really it's we need to think about solutions that do not go through this route because this route is not has not proven itself basically. It's what everybody is, was looking for for decades. And it's not happening. Um, we had a so very linked to that um, we have another question which is how can we persuade policymakers to abandon GDP um, which obviously is kind of uh, reliant on increasing consumption each year and seems like one of the big barriers to such a like beyond growth future is like getting rid of this metric that so much has been geared towards um, so yeah if you could uh, yeah. So um, I'm going to try it. I, I think I can type into the chat as well, right? So there was the, the um, mismeasuring our lives report. So the thing, the thing about GDP, uh, it's a book or a report. So it's just like you can, you can, you can find it. Um, so GDP was never intended to be a measure of welfare, of social welfare, of social progress, even from the very early days of it. Um, when, Kuznet, uh, when Kuznets, who was one of the, the people who helped develop GDP accounting, did it, he, he, he said that himself, and people have been repeating it since then. So this Mismeasuring Our Lives um, book or report is also known as the Stiglitz Sen Fitusi report after its author. So Joseph Stiglitz, Amartya Sen, and I forget Fitusi's first name, um, and or it's also known as the Sarkozy report. But that is the highest level of economic the pantheon, if you want, explaining why GDP is a rubbish metric of social welfare and it should not be a social goal. So if you want to convince policymakers that that book and the arguments in it are still valid, are still a great place to start. However, the reason that we still have GDP is because GDP actually plays another role. It has the sort of the picture role, which is it's a, it's supposed to be human welfare. It's a proxy for human welfare. Let's grow it. Let's get human welfare. But it's also doing something else. So even when you remove that part of it, sort of re remove its mask and say, listen, it doesn't look like that. That's not who it is. It is an imposter. It is still playing an important role in the economy. And that because, that's because it's a stabilizer of capital. It's stabilized. Capitalism is crisis prone. So if you understand a Marxian view of political economy, of, how the, of the dynamics of capital accumulation, Capitalism is crisis prone and it, it can only be stabilized through growth. So it's not so easy as just persuading policymakers that GDP growth is not great. They might know that. But at another level, the economy cannot abandon growth as a, as a goal until it moves, until it's protected against the crisis prone nature of capitalism. So you actually need to make it possible for firms not to grow. You need to make it possible for the financial system not to collapse if growth isn't happening. You need to make it possible for, fine, uh, for uh, pension funds to keep functioning without aggregate growth. And, uh, that, and that's why post-growth economics is so important, is because it allows you to growth-proof your economy, right? It allows you to say, to, to tell your economy how the different parts of it can still work in a growth-free world. So I think it's... It, the, the arguments against GDP are great, and the arguments against growth are great. The reality of how you transform an economy not to be dependent on it anymore is a bit more tricky, but that's what's really exciting about this research area. Thanks. And then um, we had another question from Aaron, um, who asked, um, how does kind of the cost accounting of ecosystem services, which you kind of touched upon, um, which comes under the umbrella of ecological economics. How does that differ from like the cost benefit analysis of more traditional environmental economics? So 
that's a really good question. And there's there's tons of papers on this, and um, there's Costanza, but there's also Eric Gomez Bagatun is probably one of the best people uh, on this topic. Um, it differs in quite a lot of ways. One is because it's not market oriented. We're not actually supposed to like value something at 10 million pounds and then, hey, you know what, let's destroy it because it's valued at 10 million pounds and I've got 10 million pounds in my pocket so I can pay for it. So it's not necessarily intended to be um, uh, exchanged in markets or even priced. It's intended to make it visible. It's intended for economics to take the environment into account in decision making. It's not intended for use in markets in exchange or in pricing. So that's maybe one big difference. Another difference is it's not just costing um, the inter interference in the in the like the dis the diseconomies of misusing the environment. It's not just intended to quantify that. It's quantifying the whole kit and caboodle. So it's like, hey, what if we destroy this ecosystem? What is the cost of replacement of the whole thing? Like, how much would it cost us to have to regenerate that? And very often that cost, you know, I mean, in theory, obviously that cost is infinite, but in other ways you could try to, to quantify it. Um, so I think that those are maybe maybe two directions of answer, but um, Harold might not know more about that as well when he comes around. Um, so do you, or do you wanna go through the next, I'll, I'll let you ask because there's more questions now and we, we may or may not have time to go through. Yeah, so I think we have time for a couple more. Um, for all of us. Yeah, yeah. So we have so we have time for a couple more. Um, so we'll go for Lorenzo's, um, which is quite long. So he says that the RCP scenario. Okay, I am looking. Yeah, yeah. So it maybe yeah. if you just read it instead of me. Center. Okay, so I'm not quite sure. I I completely understand the question. Um, because, and also there's like, there's a, about, I don't know which IPCC report, uh, is this the AR, okay, may, maybe AR5, okay. So um, the, the, the representative concentration pathways do not depend on drivers. So that's one of the things to understand. They don't de de depend on socioeconomics or drivers. The representative concentration pathways basically tell you about the heating gases in the atmosphere, their sort of trajectory over time. So they're not even saying how they get there. Um, so they're not the driving factor, they're the outcome of whatever else might be happening. And they're just a way of, of, of doing bookkeeping. So everybody says, oh, well, my scenario fits with this representative concentration pathway. So I think that maybe that's uh, one answer to the question. The two, the two things, um, like socioeconomic drivers and the representative concentration pathways are actually not connected in that sense. Um, and moreover, urbanization, yeah. So urbanization dynamics I don't think are as important as, as other dynamics necessarily but that's another uh, question okay amazing so I think we have time for one more uh, I'll ask a more general one um, which I've asked to uh, kind of everyone okay. who's done this and it's about uh, kind of what the general response is or has been when um, you and uh, ecological economics kind of brush up against mainstream economists how do they tend to respond to it um, so yeah, just as kind of, um, how, how would you say you feel that neoclassical economics kind of respond to ecological economics or, or your research? Right, it's not very comfortable. Um, so most ecological economists are not in um, normal economics departments. I am not somebody who had economics training. I sort of ended up in here via physics, which is actually the way a lot of people came in a lot of physicists, when they become econom economists, basically um, don't find themselves agreeing with mainstream economics very much because it's it's not very empirical. Let's put it that way. Um, so it's yeah, it's a bit fraught. We don't get published in mainstream economic journals very much. Although now the funny thing is, the Journal of Ecological Economics is highly ranked, and of course, in the neoliberal university, everybody wants to have highly ranked papers. So a lot of normal economists or more mainstream economists or environmental economic economists are trying to publish in ecological economics in our journal, our journal. Um, yeah, but, the, the, but the, we, don't, we don't get the opposite treatment. <laughs> let's, let's just say it that way. So it's hard. Uh, I would hope that things are getting a bit better, but I do know that the profession has been extraordinarily resistant to change. Um, 
somebody who's very prominent in our field, for instance, Bob Aris, uh, who's sort of a, a, a grand, grand old man of, of energy and economic studies, spent a lot of his career trying to get published in mainstream economics journals and always failed. And it, it was not because he wasn't right. So it's not easy. Um, and I think rethinking is really important here. I think pluralism and uh, efforts around pluralist economics in teaching are really important uh, to get a bit more diversity, but it's not, it's not, it's not an easy time. The, probably the best place, so the places where we have alliances are within heterodox economic communities. So there is an association for heterodox economics in the UK, which is great. Um, and there's also the political economy people. Um, so the International Initiative for the Promotion of the Political Economy, uh, IPI, uh, they're very welcoming as well. But it's, um, so we, we have alliances, but it, the alliances are more for like the people who are on the outside of the fort, I would say. I don't know if that's an answer. No, no, that was really interesting. Um... So yeah, thank you so much for that presentation and uh, answering um, those questions. It was incredibly informative.